Hey everybody, uh, here we are once more, um, this time actually with, with a fairly loaded notebook of, uh, of stuff to talk about. Uh, we start actually wanting to, to note something uh, that kind of crept up on us. When you, when you work in a deadline-driven business, what can happen sometimes is stuff happens right on deadline. Last week, Jen lauded the Globe and Mail for getting a reporter on the ground in Afghanistan, uh, Mark McKinnon, and we noted how the CBC had not. And Within a few hours of us doing that report, uh, Susan Ormiston, I, I think, in Afghanistan filed a report for the CBC. So, Jen, I guess we, we start this dispatch by saying would have been convenient for us if they'd published that report 24 hours earlier. But in any case, good job, CBC. Yeah, I mean, I just I think this is I'm perfectly happy to loud and give all sorts of praise to the people who take the risk to actually do dangerous reporting. And I just, you know, uh, good for them. Good for them. Awesome. Um, yes, it would have been much better for us if they could have gotten something on their website from her on Thursday. But I mean, if they're then not, we would have seen they, it because we both then we would have then we would have seen it, and uh, then we would have given them their due props earlier. But if they insist upon operating on their own schedules from a war zone, I suppose then uh, we have to hold off on our praise until this week. All right. Well, then, uh, duly noted. Uh, we wanted to put that on the record. The good work, Globe and Mail, and. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, Alberta, uh, with, within the last hour or so when we're filming, uh, Dina Hinshaw has uh, withdrawn an earlier statement, uh, re- well, about the death of a, of a, of a child in, in Alberta due to COVID-19. Uh, what had happened, I mean, Jen, I'll let you walk through this, but basically the government of Alberta, uh, through Dina Hinshaw, I think, had announced earlier this week that a child had died of covid and a variety of, of controversies sort of radiated out uh, from there. Well, this was really interesting. So I'll go back into the beginnings. When this originally was announced, it was a 14-year-old boy, um, died of, of, of COVID-related illness, but Hinshaw was very clear about saying that he had multiple very complicated comorbidities that contributed to his death. And originally, people just started freaking out at, at Dean Hinshaw because they perceived that as her basically excusing and justifying or minimizing the death of someone who had multiple comorbidities. Um, We'll get into that nonsense in a minute. But shortly thereafter, uh, there were some posts that started making the rounds from people who claimed to be this boy's um, sisters, uh, younger or older sisters. And they said, this is fake news. Our brother had stage four um, a brain cancer and had been in hospital since um, basically January. And, you know, he was, he was in a terminal state and he happened to test positive for COVID, um, you know, a few weeks before he died. So like they, they're basically claiming, claiming, you know, this whole thing is fake news, spread the news. The 14 year old boy did not die of COVID. He died of brain cancer. He was terminal. He wasn't, he was never getting out kind of thing. Now, then what happened today on Friday, or sorry, Thursday, when we're publishing this, is that Hinshaw comes forward and says, yeah, we're retracting that. He didn't die of COVID. You know, full retraction. This was not a COVID death. Now, this is really interesting because I tried to, within the boundaries of privacy law, I tried to um, confirm a lot of this with Alberta Health Services. And of course, Alberta Health Services can't confirm whether or not, you know, these posts were from his legitimate family or not. Um, However, they did explain to me a little bit about how they record COVID. So they said, look, if there is ever a situation where COVID might have contributed to a death, they will record that at least initially as a COVID death. And then they will go back and they'll review the file and they'll kind of weigh it out. So this is one of those situations where, you know, if somebody got into a huge car crash and had, you know, multiple organ failure and their brains falling out, um, and then they come into hospital and they test COVID, that would not register as a COVID death because I mean, he got squished by a car. (laughs) That's how, that's why he died. But in a situation where someone stay had stage four brain cancer catches COVID in hospital and the COVID might have contributed to that ultimate demise, they would say, yes, that was a COVID COVID, um, related morbidity. And the reason why they would say that is like, there's no way to know for sure if that person might've lived an extra month, might've lived an extra two months um, uh, if, if he hadn't caught COVID. So to be on the safe side, they will initially record that as a COVID death. Now, what it seems to me has happened in this case is that they went and they reviewed the file and was like, no, he died of, he died of cancer in this case. Um, so this whole backstory is really, really interesting, but it's especially interesting when you look at 
um, uh, the controversy that he and Chow wandered into on Twitter with a lot of people claiming that uh, releasing that there were multiple complicated comorbidities somehow devalued the life of the patient and that she shouldn't have released this. She should have instead just said a 14 year old died of COVID. Matt, what do you think about that? You know, it's funny. I mean, it's not funny. It's terrible. Um, my grandfather, God rest his soul, has been gone more than a decade now. He died of Alzheimer's, but his death certificate will tell you that he died in an accident, a fall. He fell because he had fucking Alzheimer's. Like, you know, like I think in our in our lives, we understand this stuff where he would get up and wander around and was uh, was, was very advanced in his in his dementia. And he was witnessed, uh, the, the accident that killed him was witnessed by others. He was up, wandering, disoriented, fell, hit his head. And, you know, the death certificate says, you know, reports the death from, from the trauma of having fallen. He died of Alzheimer's. And like, there, there's, no, there's no conspiracy here. But we live in an era where public health communications during this pandemic has been terrible. And you and I are professional communicators of a kind. We're, we're not we're not the kind who who do this kind of of work within within a, a bureaucracy. But we're communicators. Even when the information is right, we have had repeated failures in communicating that information during this pandemic. And when I heard about this poor kid in Alberta, what I thought to to myself would have been like the hospital would have come out and made this big showy announcement saying elderly man dies uh, of, of Alzheimer's. And people are like, what are you talking about? I saw him fall down in front of me. And it's like 24 hours. Later, I was like, we retract the, inner, the earlier report. He, he died of a fall. No, like people are actually capable of understanding this stuff if you communicate it to them well. And but the problem in this case is that here's the issue. The privacy legislation around these sorts you. of things is yeah. now so strict yeah. that Hinshaw can't come out and say, a 14 year old with terminal brain cancer caught COVID in hospital and died. And died either she, of or she with. Has it. To use, she has to use this really sort of vague, jargony kind of language yeah. Yeah. in order to try to communicate this. But where I think that I think the, con the people who got really angry at Hinshaw had it totally wrong is this idea that she shouldn't have communicated no. any of the context. That How dare you? It devalues the life of the child. That to... is no, no, no. First yeah. thing, now we're coming at this as a journalistic bias here where we're all like more information is better. better. Always, always, always. But so that's our bias going into this. But like when you have a population that is extraordinarily terrified and freaked out about COVID, particularly COVID um, in an un unvaccinated young people, where you've got parents terrified to send their kids to school, the absolute worst thing you can do is to be like a 14 year old died of COVID without providing any of the context because it, it fundamentally alters an individual person's risk assessment or their perception of risk for their own children and it drums up fear. To explain that someone with serious comorbidities died of COVID had comorbidities doesn't undermine or devalue the life of the patient. It's about communicating to the people who are still living so that they can make rational risk assessments in their own lives. That's what it's about. The, well, you know what? It's funny. You said we approach this with the bias of journalists. Yeah, but we also approach it with the bias of parents. Like, and I, I know this sounds terrible. I mean, obviously, the more we've learned about this case in Alberta, the more tragic it's become because this poor young man couldn't catch a break. I mean, no. terminal cancer in, in adolescence. Like, okay. Oh. Like what? What do you, what do you say? Literal worst nightmare. That's my yeah. literal worst nightmare. But at and, the same time, would. If I, if you were to tell me that like, and I've got a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and if you're to yeah. tell me that like a 14-year-old died of COVID without explaining to me that, that, that there were major serious issues, I, as a parent, my heart goes into my mouth. And I'm like, oh my God, Delta's coming for my kid, my perfectly healthy kids, which I'm very blessed and very lucky. But that fear is not necessary and it actually doesn't serve communications and it doesn't serve most families with healthy children so that they can make rational risk assessments. In the, their rea lives. the reaction, and first of all, I agree with everything you just said, the reaction uh, which I was observing, and I, I always try to not react to Twitter reactions, right? Like a bunch of people shouting on Twitter who cares? Like, cause like put, put it, put the right search terms into Twitter and you'll find the exact opposite. And then your worldview, you, your whole worldview will be confirmed. But what was interesting about this 
wasn't just that it was randoms on Twitter. People who ought to have known better were lining up with the moral position that reporting on comorbidities in, in this case was morally wrong, that it devalued the life of, of, of anyone with, with COVID-19 who, who also has a, a serious illness or a vulnerability or a disability. I think that is wildly wrong. I understand the argument they're making. Oh, it's sad that this guy died, but don't worry because X. No, I, I get it. And there is a risk of that devaluation. But here's the thing. The death of a child from COVID is exceptional. And yeah. exceptional events warrant exceptional explanations and you know what when we have people in their in their 30s 40s 50s and end up dying of covid you know we we have a general sense of what the comorbidity risk profile is uh it, obesity diabetes existing uh, cardiopulmonary issues advanced age uh immunocompromise i mean all these things lack of vaccination like we have a pretty good sense of what the comorbidities are and we don't generally report them we do make an exception though and this was, uh, I think it was Colby Kosh who, who noted this. It was just in a tweet, but I thought it was brilliant. You know, a lot of the same people who are freaking out that uh, the AHS revealed that, that this young man had comorbidities, even though it ended up being wrong, like they were wrong on this, but I think their instinct was right. The exact same people who are freaking out have no problem whatsoever when either Alberta's health service or any of the other provincial ones provide routine updates about vaccination status for the people who are in the ICUs. We're not devaluing their lives. We're just contextualizing risk. That's right. And, and well, that and is I know, I know that's exactly like, I'm what sorry, was but, done with the kid. But it is necessary to report when you're talking, especially about population statistics, it is necessary to report about comorbidities. Sure. Because like I said, it's not, it doesn't actually serve the, 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 the purpose of getting information out there, getting good information out there and getting truth out there to start pretending that you and I, Matt, are in the exact same risk profile as people who are 30 years older than us yeah. or people who are unvaccinated or people who have, have serious um, uh, yeah. issues. Who are like walking vaccine. around with somebody else's kidney, like filter. Well, exactly, exactly. So, like, so, like, so, 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 tr so trying to pretend like the risk is equal for everybody is, is, is propaganda. That's actually not reporting the news at that point. You, you, that's because it's just not true. I don't. So, I don't like the term "gen virtue signaling." I, I indulge in it occasionally because sometimes the shoe fits. But in general, everything we do signals virtue. <laughs> like, life is is a virtue signal. But there there are moments where I will use the term. I saw a lot of that going on with this because people were probably with their with their heart in and in, in the right place. Maybe not their head, but their hearts were in the right place. They wanted to signal um, fidelity they with, with they the vulnerable. They yeah, and they care. They care yeah. that this poor fourteen-year-old kid died, and it's, it, you know, it's it's always awful when a child dies. That's just it's always the fucking worst. Um, I, so if yeah, I can, there is something else though. I think, I think there yeah. is. First of, first of all, I want to make one more point about the 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 arguments we saw, and then I want to make this other point. The one more point about the argument we saw, and you and I talked about this before I hit the little red record button, was that I saw people going, "Should we start reporting on comorbidities and like plane crashes or or?" or uh, the car crashes. I don't know. Are they relevant? Yeah, you know, are like, they relevant? Exactly. If, some, like, if some kid with cancer, and I don't being flippant about a terrible thing, but if, if a kid with cancer is walking to school and gets hit by lightning, the fact that he has cancer is not relevant to that. If okay. someone with a medical condition driving a car experiences an episode of that medical condition, loses control, and wipes out 30 people on the sidewalk, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I guess relevant. You're, you're you're going to talk about his comorbidities. Yeah. Sorry, and, <laughs> and we're not devaluing the life of of anyone who died if we talk about that a medical condition contributed to an accident. We would absolutely report that. And I saw one person who really ought to have known better talking about plane crashes and car crashes. When a plane crashes, we will spend millions of dollars collecting every little bit of metal debris so that we can understand exactly what happened, because exactly what I said at the beginning, exceptional events require exceptional explanations. And, well, and I, I, that, but you're going to tell me that if the pilots didn't have a medical condition, that this wouldn't come out in the final report. And it wouldn't devalue it would. the lives of the screaming passengers to find out no, that. Of course it wouldn't, but it's, it's relevant. It's relevant. Yeah. And in this case, it's relevant too. So like, like I said, I think there's a lot to unpack on this one. I'm perfectly happy for it to be the lead item on our dispatch list. The, 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 a point I would make, though, on top of this, 
I think one of the things that no one wanted to acknowledge is that there is so much anger right now at the Alberta government, and I think most of it is warranted, that if you say anything, even if it's factually true, even if it's important, that might in some way slightly dilute someone's anti-Kenny screed, well, why are you taking Kenny's side? Yeah. I think that was a big part of this. A, like, totally. You know, oh, totally. Like, I, I was tweeting this um, uh, earlier in the week. You know, it's possible to think that Kenny completely fucked this thing up. And also that we should know that the child that died had terminal cancer. Like, knowing that does not change anything that Kenny is responsible for. But uh, it, it is just another example of what you and I have talked about, which is brain worms, we call it, which is that people, either for culture war stuff or partisan stuff or ideological stuff, they just lose the ability to actually well, think things through. So you want to get, do you want to get a really dark interpretation is that a lot of people don't want to talk about the comorbidities because they want to blame a dead 14 year old on Jason Kenny. Or, well, oh, sure. Or, I mean, I, th I think that's exactly it or anything that yeah. comes along and apparently like reduces the burden of guilt on yeah. someone that you are furious at is yeah. unwelcome. Yeah, you, like, that's, you and that's, that's a huge part of that right there. And so it's, it's, and it's a dark impulse. It's a dark, oh, very yeah. tribal impulse. Yeah. But anyway, um, we All were right, getting so I agree with you, lead item. I mean, I, I can fire that up if you want to, because you're closer. Like, what do, what do you think? Uh, flip a coin. I'm okay. happy. It doesn't matter. One thing, um, there's, you and I had actually both said um, we, we want to talk about um, uh, supply chains and, and, and inflation stuff. You had said you had an anecdote for me, which is funny because I have one for you. Um, let okay. me just tell you, let me tell you mine briefly. Um, I, you and I have been talking for a couple of weeks that we need to do something big on this. And we keep saying in every one of these dispatch videos, oh, next week we'll do it. Next week we'll do it. We haven't done it yet. We're still trying. I'm still trying to find the right people to interview. I did read though one really interesting, I'll send you the link later. It was on Bloomberg, I think. It was one of their affiliated podcasts where I finally saw the best way yet of that made it click to me what is happening with global supply chains. It's a distributed denial of service attack. And it's hmm. not a hacker that's doing it. It's just a confluence of global events which mean that our global interconnected supply chains, instead of being hit by like one big disaster in one place, it's not like a typhoon has taken out a specific port. What's happening is that there's 60, 70 little problems at 60 or 70 ports all over the world. Well, this port doesn't have enough guys on duty to be working the cranes that lift the, the thing, like the, the, the containers off the ships. Okay, well, okay, they finally got off. Well, unfortunately, the warehouses are full, so they're just sort of scattered all over the place, which means that it takes a long time for the trucks to load up the containers and drive out. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing two runs a day, each of these trucks is only able to do one uh, run a day, which basically halves your trucking capacity. So it's like, we're not looking at the big thing that is doing this what we're seeing is all over the world there are really really little problems and the thing that i thought was interesting jen was that you and i have kicked this idea around a bit i don't even remember if it was in the video last week if it was something you and i had talked about before uh or after we were rolling mm -hmm. but you and i said the gut feeling we have is that 19 months into this it's actually getting worse it's not getting better it's not like we're dealing with the, oh the, the the tail end of this thing it seems to be getting worse. And this was the first interview I've seen where the experts being interviewed are saying, oh yeah, it's getting worse. Like it, we've had massive problems through since, since March, 2020. And instead of us sort of gradually every month getting a little bit better back on track, we're, we're adjusting, we're getting caught up, we're easing the backlog. It's actually compounding and it's getting worse, not dramatically, but a little bit. And, and now we're just starting to see the effects of it. Well, what I suspect is happening is that when when this is over, and hopefully it goes well, to put it mildly, hopefully it goes well. But in any case, I think this is going to be the kind of thing, once we're far enough away from this to actually step back and do a proper sort of postmortem of it, we're going to realize that there were warning signals popping up in places we didn't notice and earlier than we thought. 
Um, That's so adorably optimistic, Matt. You think that this is ever going to be over? I think it's actually more optimistic that I think there'll be anyone left to write a report on it. You know, <laughs> so if if you want if you want to put money down on my optimism, I've I've always like I always joke with my buddies that this is a matter for future historians, if any. So I mean, I think we're we're kind of in that phase now. Look. The system has generally proven more resilient than a lot of people feared at the beginning. Like at the beginning, a lot of people were freaked out about the virus. The smart people I were talking to were not freaked out about the virus. They were freaked out up again about logistics. Like while everybody was at home sheltering from the virus, who was going to be running the stuff we need? It's interesting to me that it's getting worse and not better. But anyway, you you had something you wanted to jump in as well. So I yeah, will I chase down that funny, interview. Just, I'll flip you a copy. I just had a funny conversation with uh, uh, Ken Bosenkohl. We were chatting a little bit about politics and, and, and we wound up having a conversation about economics and um, uh, inflation and deflation at the same time, stagflation. Um, and I was talking to him about like, like, you know, Ken, how, how bad, like, cause people will know that like, there's a, there's a deep dark part of my soul that's a little bit prepper. And I was like, shit, should I be like storing up seeds? Like, and I started telling him and I was like, you know, you know, how it's nice. Like we bought, you know, 20 kilograms of flour just to be on the safe side. Now we got really good local flour and I like to bake. So it'll be fine. We'll run through that. But like, you know, Ken was like, you know, I probably wouldn't be uh, talking too much about that sort of stuff because people already think you're crazy. And I was like, wait, who thinks I'm crazy? Give me names. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I don't think anyone thinks you're crazy. Really? Now, uh, <laughs> Look, some, some some people think you're crazy. Now, did Ken think it was crazy to be buying flour? I mean, yes and no. Like, like you know, we're probably not close enough to the line where we're not going to be able to afford flour in six no. months. Yeah. But some other people might be. Well, you know what? You and I have been in, in media long enough to have been through, oh God, how many... I'm probably on my 14th annual report that X number of Canadians is $200 away from like total financial ruin. You and I have talked about this a bit. There's a lot of people who are middle class as of right now. Who aren't going to be in another two years. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, my wife and I are, uh, are, are what our business friends would call cash flow positive. Like we, 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 were, we were able to save money or, or pay down debt or prioritize things that kind of at the end of every month. But for those Canadians out there who are constantly $200 away from oblivion, your grocery bill is probably going to go up 200 bucks a month next year. And I think we're going to be a little bit isolated from the, um, the energy uh, shock that seems to be heading for our friends in, uh, in Alberta, sorry, not Alberta, in uh, Europe and uh, in China. North America has domestic energy uh, surpluses. And for now, I wish we had more pipelines, but we do have the infrastructure to distribute what we have. So we should be okay. Uh, but you know, talk, about, talk about supply chain woes. China's already idling back industrial production because they don't have the fuel. Yeah. And okay. <laughs> like right now, the problem is all the stuff that has been built can't get into the freaking port of port of Los Angeles. Yeah. What happens next year when the stuff starts getting built? When, 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 the, when there are no ships and all of a sudden the port of Los Angeles, it's easy to get a, a container ship in there because the stuff from China never arrived at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, stuff to look at there. The one thing it's funny, you mentioned um, uh, uh, Ken Bosenkuhl. I, uh, I was thinking he just wrote something for us this week and he wrote it uh, for us. Um, on on spec which basically means hey guys i wrote something like it wasn't like we talking about it, it was boom land in our inbox and we go cool um there's something i was maybe thinking of asking him to write about or if he doesn't want to or if he's busy because he's got like 70 other things he's doing we should find someone to write about this this is me bouncing an idea off you in real time should we have a smart economics person? We, can, we, we, know, we know economists. We can go peg we one of them. smart economics people. Can we have them write like a, an inflation explainer for idiots or those under 40? Because, uh, sure, if you want. Because I, like, I have lived through periods of high inflation. I was riding a big wheel. 
you know, like my, my parents have told me about that 15% mortgage on the first house that I have vague toddler era memories of like this folks. I want you all to do two things. Consider the fact that I have never lived in a high inflation environment and look at my hairline. Yeah. We're just about to say you're not young. dude. That's that's it. Right. Like we have effectively an entire generation. Plus I would say we now have half of another generation that in North America has never known high inflation. And I saw well, that, but we've, we've, we've become very accustomed to living on debt oh, and yeah. because the debt was so cheap and the money is so cheap, that was manageable. Now picture a 22%, 30% credit card fee per month. Like I, on everything annually on everything you know yeah, what i mean like like car on your student like debt. this is not this is not sustainable like the, i don't i don't think anybody in my generation could could manage that could hold that kind of a debt what i think is interesting and this is what ken had tweeted about specifically where ken had tweeted i don't remember the exact words but he's like um there's a difference between sort of like commodity inflation and monetary inflation like i'd have to actually yeah. check the exact wording here and i i think i kind of understood what he was talking about so, so, here's, 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 so we were talking about this and I, we came up with a great example to explain. Sorry, who's we? You, you and I or you? And Ken. Ken and I were yeah. talking about this. And I was like, okay, so hypothetically here, so say shipping, shipping container shit gets all kind, all super, super weird. You know, your ninja breaks, you can't have your smoothie in the morning. Okay, that sucks, but you can't, you can't replace your ninja because you can't get the parts to replace the ninjas in North America anymore. So much of it, every single part is coming from 1500 different places. So you break down the supply chains and all of a sudden we could make half a blender in North America, but we can't mm -hmm. make a whole one, which means your blender breaks, you go to the store and in three months, you can't replace it because we just can't get blenders in. And that's just what it is. So you can live without a blender. Fine. All right, fine. I don't need a blender. You call that living. But, but I mean, we've also lived in a society where all of this shit we have is, is really low quality and breaks at a fairly high rate and mm -hmm. there's no point repairing it. So there's no repair guys anymore. Right. Okay. So this is fine when we're talking about your blender or your toaster or whatever you will make do. What happens when your computer breaks? Mm -hmm. What happens when your phone breaks? Now, all of a sudden for people like you and me, my computer breaks and I can't replace it. That's mission critical. My phone breaks. That's mission critical. Um, that fundamentally shifts my whole ideology around the disposable culture. Because all of a sudden, if, if I can't reliably replace or repair that computer, I can't make money. I can't work. Okay. So then I come back to the situation. I go, all right, so how do I adjust my behavior in that kind of, in that kind of um, environment? Well, maybe I'm not spending $1,500 on a computer I've got to repair every, I've got to repair or replace every year and a half to two years. Maybe instead of that, I'm paying $5,000 for my computer but that computer is going to last me 15 years mm -hmm. and it's all made with all Mer North American parts that I can replace within a walking distance of where I live. Okay. So initially that's like, Oh, well, that's a terrible deal for you. I mean, you're having to spend five grand on a computer. That's insane. Except when you realize, okay, but rather than spending $15,000 over computer equipment over the course of 15 years, I'm spending $5,000 on, on a computer over the course of that same 15 years. So here's how you have a situation where the, the initial purchase cost of the item has rapidly gone up, radically gone up, but it's amortized out over a long period of yeah. time. So this is what you have is it's initially it's inflation and deflation at the same time, because you're actually spending only a third as much money, getting a third as much money back into the system. But there's a one-time booking of but an inflationary but, charge. That's yeah. right. That's called stagflation. The last 19 months have kind I mean, if you have not come away from the last 19 months questioning a whole lot of stuff, I don't know what you've been doing these last 19 months, because the fact that the people who are in elite positions of power don't understand that their credibility has been fundamentally demolished, demolished. over the last 19 months. Yeah, I, I, I can't help you. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not just I'm not I'm not I'm not giving, getting us up hooked. The media is to, on it too. Mainstream media, public health, economics. Not, I don't trust any of these people anymore. I don't you, trust anybody. You and I are not old enough to remember like the 18% mortgages from the early 80s, but we certainly are old enough. And we were both in the game by then uh, in, in 08, 09, when there was the huge um, deficit spending in Canada, I'd say globally, uh, the, the quantitative easing. Governments pumped money into the economy and there had been this expectation that there was going to be massive inflation. You had, the, you had the, the gold newsletter guys going, convert all your net worth into gold and, and silver right well, those now. Those guys made a killing. They made a killing, but it never happened. 
like 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 it, what what they had been worried about yeah. never happened we have heard so many times over the last almost two years look it didn't happen after 08 it didn't happen after 09 it's not going to happen now yeah but because but there I, were never any consequences we just kept on ratcheting up the quantitative easing what i find really interesting and we you mentioned that elite opinion before hey you and i are national call we're, like, we're, 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 we're our opinion. lead opinion um we, are lead opinion. So, we get things wrong by the way Yay! once or twice um something interesting has started to happen over the last couple of weeks i i'm watching this and again this is not predictive i i cannot tell you what's going to happen with inflation nothing i should tell you about inflation you shouldn't believe me i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about that's why i want to go find someone who does but you want to know what i have noticed o- over the last couple of weeks let me describe for you in 15 seconds or less, the, the last 12 years of elite opinion on North American inflation, not going to happen, not going to happen, not going to happen, not going to happen, didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen, not going to happen, not going to happen, might happen. That is the first time we've heard that coming from very well, small there's, people since well, and also there's, there's, there's also an interesting conversation about how, the degree to which there's a, there's a psychological element when it comes to inflation, right? Oh, if you're afraid, yeah. if you're, if you're, and which, which isn't, can't be predicted, right? Like that is, that's because that's about mass psychology and mass psychological yeah. dynamics, which, which, you know, animal spirits, right? Um, so if you are worried that in six months, the thing you want to buy is going to be 20, 30, 40% more, more expensive, the incentive right now is to buy it. You got to buy it right now. Snap it up and start acting as if you were working in a high inflationary environment, which is going only puts increased pressure on the supply side. Which, mm-hmm. when you're already dealing with all these weird batshit supply chain issues, only increases issues on that. I mean, we've already heard, hey, there's going to be a shortage of toys by Christmas. So if you're smart and paying attention, you're buying your toys for your kids now. Santa right? handles the toys in, in my house, Jen. Let's be. Well, yeah, that's Very that's because you're a rich that. white man. There you go. Anyway, <laughs> you've got a direct line. Um, but I mean, the, the, it, it changes people's behavior and people's relationships to the whole economic system, depending on what kind of environment they think that they're heading mm-hmm. into, right? Yep. Um, pay down your debt, buy everything you want right away is how to handle the situation if you think that we're heading into a persistent inflationary cycle. Well, you know what? I mean, let's let, let's not name them here in case they brutally reject us, but let's go poke around a little bit with some of our uh, economists, of which we know a few. Let's just find out if someone wants to write that, because I mean, I think some of these economists themselves are probably young enough to have only read about this stuff in the textbook. I have one more item on my agenda. What about you? Uh, you want to talk about Dominic Barton? I do want to talk about Dominic Barton. Okay. I mean, we're, we're really going long here. What the fuck, Dominic Barton? So Dominic Barton, I mean, that, that could be the headline. Um, <laughs> Dominic Barton's our ambassador to China. And we just got the two Michaels back. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, uh, the I don't know how to pronounce it yet, AUKUS, the Australia, UK, US AUKUS, thing. AUKUS. AUKUS, okay, AUKUS. whatever. Um, the, um, there's, a, there's some polls floating around right now from some reputable companies basically saying that like, the, the, the one issue that can unite Canadians right now is that we're fucking furious at the Chinese government. And Dominic Barton comes out this week and he's like, oh, no. And the one, and the one other thing I should mention is preamble is that the, the government's coy right now on whether or not there's going to be sort of a new China policy. It's kind of, well, you know, we need to get the cabinet installed. We got to get the uh, blah, blah, blah. We got to do all that uh, procedural stuff. But we're, we're cl- carefully monitoring the situation, blah, blah, blah. Dominic Barton in Beijing or maybe he was here when he said it, but our man in Beijing comes out and goes, Canadians, great opportunities right now in China. Buy, 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 invest, make, make a buck. Dude, read the room. I would like to see this a new the, China I mean, policy. The, 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 this, this is the same government as the CBC just broke, you know, actively engaged oh, yeah. the Chinese military in vaccine procurement. And then later claimed, well, that didn't stall us from going out and go searching other avenues eventually yeah we you know what that was true. Even on this. That i was, mean i mean like, that was the fifth, that's the fifth that, estate this, report and this, right? yes yes and this was literally after they kidnapped the michaels we would put ourselves at their mercy by making ourselves even for a few weeks dependent on them shipping their vaccine to us it'd be like poland I, sending a trade I, delegation to berlin in september 1939 like guys like i'm sitting here and i'm just going like Okay, three years ago, three years ago, fine. Three years ago, there was still some like, some mushiness around this sort of stuff. 
at this point, you can't seriously be this naive. You can't seriously be this naive about China and, the, and what is willing. Like, it's just, it is absolutely baffling to me. It's baffling to me that these people cannot see what's right in front of their faces. Well, we'll put that in the dispatch. Um, <laughs> I still like that proposed headline. What the fuck, Dominic Barton? Um, yes, I'm happy okay. to do that. So, right, so you want to do Barton? Uh, I'll, I do think Barton. I'll do Barton. Uh, I'll You'll do, do Hinshaw. Props, okay, you do props to CBC. You do Hinshaw. I can take a swing at supply chains and uh, Barton. As before, we'll we'll poke around with our our buddies, um, and we'll we'll see if anyone else wants to contribute anything. And then you should try and get that CBC Fifth Estate scoop into the Barton section. And on that cheerful note, folks, thank you. Uh, we'll check in with you again later. Have an amazing weekend, folks. We will get this out to you shortly. Take care.